presence of the Lord is here. Ooh, thank you, Jesus. It's exciting uh, to bring the word when you feel the presence of God. We know he's here every week and that we got to be attentive, but there are some times where God's presence is thick, and I sense that today. Lord, help us. Lord, get me out of the way. Speak, Lord, the word that you have today. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Woo. This, uh, this last month, we've been going over the book of Ruth, and uh, we have not by any means rushed through this story. We have taken it one chapter at a time, one week at a time. And uh, all the way, all the way along, we've, we've known what's coming this day, and we're excited about it. But at the same time, we've been waiting in expectation, okay? And I feel kind of bad, honestly, for Pastor Noel. He's been building up, to, and I get to preach the good part of the, of the story. And uh, I get to preach the awesome ending of the story. Uh, but before we get to today's passage, we're going to be in Ruth chapter 4 today, if you want to turn your Bibles there. But before we get there, I just want to go over briefly uh, where, how we got to the point that we are today. So in scene 1, chapter 1, we get a setting of this story, an introduction uh, to the two main characters in this story. And the setting takes place in Moab during the times of the judges. This is the time when the judges ruled. And there was a famine and there was a woman named Naomi. She had a husband, and she had two sons, and they got married to a woman named Orpah and Ruth. And then Naomi's husband dies, along with her two sons. And then Orpah ends up leaving Naomi to go back to her people and Moab. And so now she is left with Ruth, and Ruth is going to cling on to Naomi and she says, wherever you go, I'm going to go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And so right at the beginning of this story, we have death, we have famine, and we have a time where the judges are ruling, and there's a lot of civil unrest. And so they decide they're going to go back to, uh, to Bethlehem because they heard that there was food there. And uh, when Naomi gets back, the people recognize Naomi, and they say, is that Naomi? And Naomi's like, don't call me Naomi anymore. Y'all, you need to call me bitter, because that's who I am. I lost my husband, I lost my two kids, and I just got back from a place of famine. And that's where the scene ends. Here comes the curtain. Woo! Everybody go, uh. You got to repeat after me. Uh, uh. Yeah, bad scene. Curtain reopens. We're in chapter 2 now. Scene 2. And so far, this story stinks, okay? Lots of death. Everybody's hungry. Not a good time. Lost civil unrest. And uh, so they get back and they say, call me bitter. And we see that Naomi and Ruth have two huge needs right now. They have the need for food and they have the need for family. They've lost their family, and there's no food, and so they go to uh, they go to uh, they go to Bethlehem. And in scene two, they still have this need for food, and so with permission from Naomi, Ruth starts to glean from these fields, and she starts to gather food from the barley harvest, and she works so hard that she catches the eye of a man named Boaz. Bow, chick, wow, wow. All right, here comes Boaz. All right, this story's getting interesting now. And it says that Boaz is a worthy man. And Boaz heard how Ruth's husband had died, and now she was so loyal to Naomi. That wouldn't have been normal uh, during these times, what Ruth did. And Boaz tells Ruth not to go anywhere else, but to get barley only from his field. And so Boaz provided her with water and protection, and she goes back to Naomi with all this food, and Naomi is full of joy and excitement. And then she heard, hears about Boaz. And she's like, 
wait, Boaz? Boaz is a part of our clan. Hold up. He's awesome, and he's one of our redeemers, one of our kinsmen redeemers. And then closes the curtain. And now we're kind of liking the story a little bit better. All the women are like, oh. And all the men are like, bro. Boaz, letting them glean from the field. Good choice, Boaz. I see what you're doing. And it says that uh, at the end of the scene that Naomi and Ruth live together. So God has provided uh, the food, okay? So they have food. One of the needs has been taken care of, but there's still another need. What's the other need? Family, okay? Food and family. So there's still a need for family. So it opens with Naomi, and Naomi has come in with a plan. She's... She's a schemer, okay? And she wants Ruth to wear her best clothes, uh, and she's showing that uh, Ruth's time of mourning for her husband is over. And she wants Ruth to go to Boaz when he's sleeping, uncover his feet. And this really is basically a very bold uh, wedding proposal, okay? And when she does this, Boaz is ecstatic. And he says... May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first, and that you have not gone gone after your young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do all that you ask for. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. Okay, so she proposes, and Boaz is like, yes! And they're they're at the... the floor, and I can just imagine they're looking up at the stars. And this is when you start to hear the love music from, like, The Lion King. Can you feel the love tonight? Ruth and Boaz are getting married. Like, this is what we're imagining, okay? This is what's about to take down. But then, all of a sudden, we think the curtain is closing, but it's not. Because Boaz goes on. And it says, and now it is true that I am a redeemer. Yet. What? What? Wait, what? What was that? Yet. There is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain here at night in the morning. If he will redeem you, good. Let him do it. But if he's not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down and wait until the morning. And so Ruth then goes after the morning, goes to Naomi, And Naomi says, wait, here comes the curtains. And now we're like, hold up. Boaz is truly Ruth's true love. He was willing to redeem it, but now we find out there's another redeemer. What is going to happen to Ruth? What's going to happen to Naomi? What in the world? And we're into this expectation. And now, scene four, the curtains are rising. Are you ready? Here we go. Chapter 4. Oops. Now, Boaz has gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Turn aside, friend. Sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. All right, so we can tell right from the beginning, this curtain is open, and Boaz is up at the gate, and he's looking for that Redeemer guy. He doesn't even give him a name. It's old what's-his-face. There's old what's-his-face, okay? Come here, buddy. Sit down here. So he sits down, and then he's got to find some elders. So he's grabbing the elders. He's like, guys, we got to get some business done here. Sit down here. Boaz is on a mission. He wants his woman, okay? And so he tells them all, sit down. And so they start to sit down and they start to discuss. And it says, And he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, Buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if not, tell me that I may know For there is no one besides you who can redeem it. And after you, I am the only one who can redeem it. Okay? So, we're starting to think here. What is Boaz thinking? 
all right? He got the guy there, uh, the Mr. What's-His-Face, not given a name in the Bible. Mr. What's-His-Face is sitting here. He's got the elders here, and he tells them, listen, buddy, there's a parcel of land over there, and I can't buy it because you're next in line. You're the only one who can redeem it. In a place, in a culture where land is everything, obviously the choice is that this guy wants to redeem it. And we're thinking to ourselves, Boaz, like, why did you make it so good? He put it on a silver platter for Mr. What's-His-Face, okay? And he says, there's some land, and you're the only one who can buy it. Do you want it? And the guy says, I will redeem it. What was Boaz thinking? But then Boaz is so creative, and he starts to go over the fine print in this contract. He starts to say, but wait, there's more, okay? And so he says, if you will redeem it, redeem it. And after you comes me, and he says, I will redeem it. Then Boaz says, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you will also require Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead and his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take the right of redemption for yourself. I cannot redeem it. Yes! This is the moment we've been waiting for. Okay? So he brings all the people together. He says, Mr. Redeemer guy, what's your face? Here's the land. You're the only one who can redeem it. He's like, yeah, I'll redeem it because I want my land. But when you redeem it, you also get this lovely Moabite woman, Ruth. And now all of a sudden, he's got to take care of this woman who's at the age that she can have another son, and it would be his duty as the husband to make this line go on. And so he starts to think he's got to feed another mouth, and then he's got to get another mouth to feed Who knows, he might have some daughters. He's got to get a son. So all of a sudden, all this that was looking so good has taken on a huge responsibility. And he says, you know what? Scratch that idea. I didn't read all the fine print. You go ahead and take it. And Boaz is like, I will redeem it. And so when the people are here at the gate, it says that he gets uh, some of the elders. And I imagine as they are talking, people are just... You know, people are kind of nosy, and this is a culture that wants to know what's going on. There's all sorts of people. And then it says that uh, it goes on, and it tells us in uh, verses 8 through 10. It says, so when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the land the hand of Naomi and all that belong to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and Malon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead and his inheritance. That name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of the native place. You are witnesses to this this day. And so Boaz becomes this kinsman redeemer. He buys the land, he buys Naomi and Ruth, and now he says, I'm going to make... Naomi, my wife. And then it just says that the people, not Naomi, Ruth, my wife, hello. Ruth, my wife. And so uh, then it says that the people bless him. And then it goes on to verse 13. It says, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. Oh, the moment we've been waiting for. I'm getting married in the morning. Okay, like, it's here. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went to her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the woman's, women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And may his name be renowned in all Israel. And it says that Naomi has a child on her lap and that she took care of him as well. And so, curtain closes, and we're like, whoop, whoop, this story is awesome. And it's been quite a story as we've looked throughout this month 
of what has taken place for each of these characters. Naomi, who at the beginning of this story has a horrible, horrible start. She loses her husband. She loses her two sons. One of her daughter-in-law leaves her, and she is in the middle of famine, and she's going through so much pain that she changes her name, and she says, call me Mara, which means call me bitter. But now it ends with Naomi, and she's holding her grandchild. And the curtain is closing, and she's like, no longer call me bitter. Call me overly excited, super proud grandmama, okay? So that's what she changed her name to. It's in the message. And then you have Boaz. And Boaz is known as a noble man who continues to follow the ways of the Lord, and he continues to act nobly throughout, and he gets to marry a noble woman, all right? And then it has Ruth. And Ruth really didn't have it much better than Naomi. Look at the progress of Ruth as you look through what is she is called throughout the book. She is Ruth, the widow. And then she becomes Ruth, the Moabite, which also would be known as Ruth, the foreigner. Ruth, the servant who was gleaning in the fields. But now she is Ruth, the wife of Boaz. And now she has given birth to a son. And all throughout this time, Ruth has been known as a noble character, but now it has come to completion. But who is in the background of all of this that is going on? I think we can get really caught up in these characters, but not really see who is the true, who is the star of this show? Who's in the background of all this? It is the Lord. The Lord is the main character throughout this. And while you don't see Him all the time, He's not mentioned very much within this story, God is the main character. He's not mentioned directly, really, except twice. It says that God does two things. Okay, throughout this whole story. What are, the, what are the main needs for Naomi and Ruth at the beginning of the story? Remember? Food and family. Right, okay. Let's go to verse, chapter 1, verse 6. This is so awesome. All right, so it says, Then they, they, she arose with her daughters-in-law to return to the country of Moab, for she heard that the fields of Moab, that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. Whoa. Hold up. What was, the, what was the need? They needed food. The Lord had given people food. Oh, the Lord provided. Okay. We go in now to chapter 4. This is so awesome. Hope you're paying attention. All right. 4.13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went to her, And the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Hold up. You mean to tell me, at the beginning of the story, their need was food, and that their need was family. And the only time that the Lord is strictly uh, directed that he said he did something was the Lord. What did he do? He gave them food, and that the Lord gave them family. The Lord is the one who made these things happen in God's sovereign hand. That's awesome. But if we're not careful, we can miss one of the biggest things that we might not even recognize as we read this story as a need. And I want to go over that today. And as we read the Bible Today, in our culture right now, it is easy to read Scripture, okay, as what was going on during that time. So we read the story from uh, the, the perspective of what was going on in the story. And then it's easy to read Scripture as, that's what went on in the story, so how does it apply to me? But there's also another way that we need to read Scripture if we're going to see fully what God has for us. So... This book was written at a specific time, at a specific place, for a specific audience, okay? And it's been passed down 
from now on, but somebody had somebody in mind when they wrote this story. And so, um, as we uh, look at the book of Ruth, scholars estimate that this book was written sometime uh, after 1000 B.C. And if we look at that time period, we see that the kingdom of Israel is now divided, okay? Israel, the chosen people of God, are now divided. They're at civil war with each other, and they have broken into two different camps. And it is a very, very dark time in history for the people of Israel. And there's no real stability. Some are following God while others are doing their own thing. Some are worshiping God while others are worshiping whatever they want to do. And it is hostile times. Now, it seems that the book of Ruth was written for all of the Israelites. No matter if you were in this camp or if you're in this camp, this book was written for you. And I think that it was hope to unite these two that were um, together. And it tells us in the very beginning of the book of Ruth, in the days when judges ruled. Okay, now that might not mean much to us today. But if we look at the context of what the judges, what that day looked like what in the day of Judges. If you go to the book of Judges, there are some things that you're going to find out, okay? There are some things uh, that describe what was going on in Israel. The first one is, Israel was doing evil. That phrase, doing evil, is repeated 16 times in the book of Judges. So Israel, in the time of the Judges, was just doing evil, Again and again and again, it says, and the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, okay? And then, there's another way that they explain it. It says, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Israel isn't following God. Israel isn't following God's chosen leader. Israel is just doing whatever is right in their own times. And that explains uh, the time period of Judges, And in that horrible time is when the story of Ruth, when everybody's doing their own thing, when people are doing evil in the eyes of the Lord, that's the, that's the background of where the story of Ruth is taking place. And there was no real leader to follow God. There was no real king that followed. And many people were just doing their own things. And the first readers of Ruth understood that the time of the judges, because... In this time, they were living in the same thing. Does that make sense? The first audience to this book is living in a time of civil unrest, spiritual brokenness, and they're split. And it says in the book of Ruth that it took place in the time of the judges where people are doing evil in the eyes of the Lord. They're doing whatever they think is okay in their own eyes. And so, how in the world does the book of Ruth, this love story, have anything to do about what these people are going through in the middle of this civil war? Okay, so to answer that question, we got to go back into the book of Ruth, okay? And I want you to imagine again, as we're telling this story, Naomi there, and she's in a rocking chair. She's rocking back and forth, her little grandbaby boy. Aw, and the curtains close. And now you as the audience think, this story is over. What a great story. And you stand up, and you're, you're plotting your hands, and you're clapping, you're cheering on, and you're like, wow, that was great. And you start to get your coat, and you start checking your phones because you think that the story is over. But now all of a sudden, something happens that you were not expecting. The curtain starts to open again, and you realize that there is more to this story. So you, you get back in your seat, you shut, and you sit down. And what do we read? It says, Then Naomi took the child and laid, her, laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the woman of the neighborhood gave him the name, a saying, A son has been born to Naomi. Okay? And so we open up, curtains open up, Naomi is there, 
And then the announcement comes. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of David. What? They named him Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of... Do they mean King David? What? Ruth is the great-grandmother of King David? Why? And if you're an Israelite, you're, you're thinking, this is insanity. Are we sure that this is the right thing? And just so they make sure that you understand this point, in case if you missed it, they do ten names here at the last section, going over the genealogy of David. Why is David a big deal? Because uh, Israel's history, the pinnacle, is when King David is ruling. That's when God was uh, walking with David, and Israel is at peace, okay? King David was a godly leader. Okay, so what does that say to the people going through this dark time of civil war? Well, I'm thinking to myself, if I'm going through civil war, and I'm reading this story, and the background of this story is, in the time that judges ruled, well, what was that time? Everybody's doing evil in the eyes of the Lord. People did whatever they wanted to, whatever they thought was right. There is so much evil that goes on in the book of Judges. And yet here we have this story of Ruth and a man named Boaz in the midst of all these things where people are just doing whatever they want to do and they're doing evil. There's a man named Boaz who's a worthy character. And Boaz doesn't do just whatever he wants to do. Boaz isn't doing evil in the eyes of the Lord. Boaz is simply obeying God where he is right there. He can't change his society. He can't change the background of where he's at. People are making crazy decisions. But we have a worthy man named Boaz who, de Boaz, who day after day after day does what the Lord wants him to do. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, coincidence, I think not, Ruth comes into his life. And Boaz just keeps on doing what God wants him to do. And Ruth is following out the Lord. And they get married. And then through that comes Obed. After Obed comes Jesse. After Jesse comes David. And that's when you have the redemption of, of the people of Israel. And so if I'm hearing that, and my nation is at civil war with each other, I'm thinking, man, if God is in the midst of this time of the judges, well, surely, surely he's in the midst of what I'm going through right now. And there might be stuff that I don't understand that's going on, but God must be at work. And this story has the same implications for us. The setting for the book of Ruth is the same setting that we live in today. People who do evil in the eyes of the Lord. People who do what is right in their own eyes. In our world, we are heavy. We have a lot of unrest right now. What's going to go on with uh, North Korea? What are they going to do? ISIS just claimed uh, responsibility for the last act of terror. In our country, we have a lot of unrest. White supremacist groups coming out. Hate speech on every side is coming out. We have a media and government that we cannot fully trust. Where do you go to? In our society, we have people doing what is right in their own eyes. 
what is true for me is true for me is what is true for you is true for you. Unless if you disagree with me, then you're a bigot. In a culture where truth has become so relative that you can say something as simple as there are two genders, you're considered closed-minded fool. Truth has become so relative. I said that today in Sunday school, and one of our high schoolers said, that just happened to me this week. They said, uh, they were talking to somebody and they said, I'm gender fluid. I can change. It just kind of depends on the day. This is where we're at. This is what your kids are growing up in. And when truth is no longer what God says it is, but what seems right in my own eyes, you lose the sacred. Marriage is no longer sacred. Fast and easy divorce. Or marriage is redefined because it's not sacred, so it can be between two men or two women. Life. Life no longer is sacred. So I don't care what I do to a baby. It's no longer a life. It's just a choice. Life is no longer sacred, so I can talk and treat people who are different color than me or different culture than me however I want to. Authority is no longer established by God, and so authority is really uh, not by God. It's just a nuisance. Kids are allowed to talk to teachers however they want, their parents however they want, and to have authority however they want. And you start to see when truth becomes relative, you're seeing what happens within our country. It's starting to crumble. And this is where Ruth is at. This is the background of this whole story. This is where the first audience is at, where there is civil and spiritual unrest. And this is where we find ourselves today. And so what is the message for us? That there is hope. That there is hope because the same God who was working in the time of the judges is the same God of today. The same God who provided food and family for Ruth and Naomi and Boaz is the same God of today. And so what do we learn from the book of Ruth? First, we live that we need to live in obedience day after day after day. Our background right now is people are doing evil in the eyes of the Lord, and whatever you want to do, that's okay for you. So what do we do? Do we just get to do whatever we want to do? No, we live by the Word of God. God, what do you want me to do today? Lord, how am I supposed to live your life? Lord, I'm hearing a lot of different lies, God. What is truth? Christians, we are not just feeling and all gushy stuff. we got to think we got to use our minds and think, where does this take us? And God gives us truth, and truth is not something that I can make of it. Truth is something that has to be discovered, and that can only come from God. We need Christians that are not just feely-neely and, oh, we got to do this and that. You need to think and talk logically to people. Know the reason why you have the faith that you do. We got to use our brains and we got to have a a conversation with people. Okay? And Boaz is living day to day in obedience. And through that obedience, God not only blesses the brokenness where he is at, where Ruth is at, and where Naomi is at, but what does he do? God redeems the brokenness of this society. Boy. Church? You think it doesn't matter how you live your life? You think personal holiness is just a choice? It has no implication in our society? Uh Uh-uh. What would it look like if Brockington Road was on their face before God saying, Lord, I repent, I am sorry, I am going to live this life for you. I believe that we would not only see healing within the individual, we would not just see healing within the family, we would not just see healing within our church, from things that go way back when. But we might see healing 
within our society, within Sherwood, within Arkansas, within America, but it takes somebody who's living day after day after day in obedience to God and saying, Lord, you can have me. What is truth? Lord, I want to know your truth and I want to live by it. And you look into, you look into this genealogy because we can't do this on our own. You look into this genealogy and it, and it ends with David. And these guys didn't even know what was coming next. And you look at the time when Israel is divided, they didn't even know what was coming next. Because if we go on to Matthew, you see the names of Ruth and Boaz and Obed and Jesse and David, all within the genealogy of our risen Lord Jesus Christ. Man, God thinks ahead. Like, I have a hard time thinking two weeks ahead. Like, he thought ahead. And if God was in the redemptive business way back when, what do you think he's up to right now? And I don't think Naomi and Ruth and Boaz even understood it. But God was doing something for the redemption of, us, of the society. And then, way back further on, the redemption of the whole world through the Son of Jesus Christ. Because, <laughs> oh, oh bad, I mean, Boaz is just being obedient, listening to the law, living the law. Friends, you might be in the midst of something where you're like Naomi and you are broken. And you're so broken, you might even be bitter. Be bitter towards people. You might be bitter towards God. May this story encourage you that there is hope. It might have taken a while, but God brought redemption to Naomi. You might be like Ruth. Ruth had different Different identities. She was the Moabite. She was the foreigner. She was the slave girl. She was the widow. And you might have taken on your own different identity. Luke the broken. Luke the sinner. Whatever it might be. And Jesus is just waiting there. As Boaz was waiting for Ruth to redeem her. Christ wants to redeem you and say, uh, you're no longer these things that you name yourself, but you are my child. There is hope for you today. Application for today. Be like Boaz. In the midst of our background, where people are doing whatever is right in the eyes of themselves, and they're doing evil in the eyes of the Lord, do not let that be the measuring stick of how you live your life. That you're better than so-and-so. Who cares? What is truth? What is truth? And that's what we must live our life by. And we can only do it through the power of the risen Savior, Jesus Christ.